Do I have to turn this on or am I on already? How about now? Okay. So, uh, because of some situations at my mother's house, we were staying up at the Bob Bob Rosa. Everybody been there? And um, so, as that's my habit, I usually take my sermon and I'll go out early morning and I'll walk around and I'll kind of go over my my notes and my sermon. And I was doing that up at the Bob Rosa, which is a beautiful place, uh, you know, to walk around at. And uh, I got down this one road, and a truck, big truck, came down, passed me, and all of a sudden it just stopped. And the guy got out, and he said, what are you doing? And I'm carrying my sermon notes. He said, are you inspecting the campground? <laughs> I said, no, I'm about to rehearse my sermon for this morning. <laughs> okay? All right? Thank you. He got back in his truck and left. And uh, I thought afterward, maybe I should have invited him to church, but I think he was a little put back by just knowing that I was out there, you know, reciting and working on my sermon a little bit. It's interesting how the Lord uh, brings people into your lives. Mm. Uh, and I'm praying for him. I, I, he said he's the owner of the campground. So, who knew? I'm going to do a song this morning to start out with. my Savior, my God. If you know it, I'm probably not going to do it exactly the way that uh, Aaron Schuss did it, but uh, I hope that you are blessed by it, and I hope the Lord uses it in your life. What God has 
in scripture the Bible says that God has promised to meet our needs he's promised to meet our emotional needs our financial needs God's promised to meet our physical needs our spiritual needs our relational needs every need of your life God has promised to meet in fact one of the Hebrew names of God is Jehovah Jireh we used to sing a chorus like that I don't know if you ever sang it Jehovah Jireh, my provider, my God is sufficient for me. Remember that course? Jehovah Jireh, it means I am the God who provides for you. I am the God who provides for you. And over and over, God says, I will meet all your needs, all your needs. And one of the promises that he makes to us in Philippians 4.19 is this. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. If you haven't been memorizing scripture, that's a great scripture verse to memorize. And my God shall supply all my need, all your need, according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So what does this, what does this include? I mean, that's a pretty blanket statement. He says, I'll meet all your needs. Everything, right? That's what it means. And the problem is this. You look around, and obviously not everybody's need is met. You look around, you say, well, their need isn't met. In reality, many times our needs seem to go unmet. That's the way it seems. So what's the problem if our needs seem to be unmet? Is God lying? Is God exaggerating the point? 
I mean, is he just saying something that sounds really nice but isn't really true? Why is it that sometimes my needs seem to go unmet? Isn't that a great question to ask? Why does it seem like that? The Bible tells us that with every promise, there is a condition, and we have to understand that. Listen to this carefully because it's going to impact your life if you take this in. If you get a hold of this message and the truths that, are, that God is conveying, it will change your life and it will help you in your life. The Bible tells us that with every promise, there is a condition. There is a premise with every promise. And one of the conditions for this promise is you have to trust Him. You have to trust God. The more you trust God, the more God is able to meet the needs in your life. The more you trust Him. The less you trust God, the fewer needs He's able to meet in your life. The Bible says there is a faith factor involved. A faith factor. Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, verse 29. Jesus said it. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Amen? You don't want to hear what I want to say. You want to hear what Jesus says. And this is what Jesus says. According to your faith, it will be done unto you. According to your faith. God says you get, you get to choose how much I bless your life. It's according to your faith. You get to choose how many needs I meet in your life. It's according to your faith. The more you trust me, Christian, the more you trust me, the more needs I can meet. Isn't that awesome to think about that? The obvious question then is, how can I learn to trust God more? How can I trust God to learn to trust Him more so that He can meet all of my needs? How can I learn to have greater faith? I mean, faith is an interesting substance. You don't get it. You don't get faith by sitting in a Bible study group. You don't get it there. You don't get it by just talking about it. You don't get faith just by thinking about it and hoping and wishing. Faith is like a muscle, and I want you to understand that. It's like a muscle. The more you use a muscle, the stronger it gets. It has to be developed by being used. The more you use the little faith that you've got, the more it gets stretched. And the more it gets stretched, the more God is able to bless your life. Amen? We call the circumstances that God creates to stretch our faith trials. The circumstances that God uses to stretch our faith are trials, the trials of our lives. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The revelation, the coming of Christ. In other words, these trials are only to test your faith to show that it's strong and pure. And the Bible tells us that, that like fire, when the heat's on, it purifies gold, it purifies silver. And so God tests our hearts by putting us under the heat, those fiery trials of life, to purify us, to refine us. So today I want, I want to look at four of the most common types of trials, tests. And chances are you're in one of these tests right now. They're trials, but they're really tests. And so whether you are or not under one of these tests going, or if you're in some kind of a trial, I guarantee you that over the course of your life, you're going to go through more trials, and you're going to go through one of these four tests that I'm going to share with you this morning over and over and over again. You're going to, you're going to be tested. God's going to test you. He's going to put you through these trials. And when you go through them, you can know and you can say, this is an opportunity for me to develop my faith. Because that's what God wants us to do. He wants to develop our faith, our trust in Him. Amen? So the first test that we're going to look at this morning is the pressure test. The pressure test. 
The pressure test asks the question, how will I handle stress? How will I handle stress? Everybody has some type of stress. The question is, how will I handle it? Will I depend on myself or will I depend upon God? Will I turn to other things or will I turn to God? Psalm 50, verse 15 says, I want you to trust me in your times of trouble so I can rescue you and you can give me glory. Because that's what God wants from us. He wants us to bring him glory to our lives. Amen? God says, I want you to turn to me when you're in trouble. Not to other things. I want you to turn to me. When you're in trouble, I want you to turn to me. Amen? Amen? I want you to turn to me when you're in trouble, not to other things. I mean, do we do that? Are you doing that right now? We usually don't. We usually have God about number nine or number ten on the list. We turn to everything else first to relieve our stress before we turn to God. And some of you say, when I get under stress, I know what I need. I need one of those little pills. So I go to my medicine cabinet and get that little pill, and then I won't be so stressed. No, and, and it doesn't last. So you say, well, I know what I'll do. Uh, I'm all tense and nervous and stressed out by my problems. I'll call a friend up and complain about my problems to my friend. So you call a friend up, and you get on the phone, and you complain about all the stress in your life, and you hang up, and you're still under all this stress. So you say, well, I know what I'll do. I'll make some nachos. Eating is always a good way to get, get rid of stress. <laughs> right? Yeah. I'll make some nachos. I'll nuke them in the microwave, and then I'll eat them. And, you know, when my stomach's full, uh, I'll still have all the stress. It doesn't go away. So you say, I know what I'll do. I'll go shopping. When the going gets tough, the tough go shopping. And that'll get rid of my stress. Or if you're a guy, you say, I know what I'll do. I'll sit down and I'll watch a game on TV or I'll go fishing. And maybe you'll find some relief from your stress by some of these things, but it's not going to take the stress away. And then along comes God about ninth or tenth place. And God says, I want you to turn to me. When you're under stress, this is a test. You have a legitimate need in your life that needs to be met. The problem is you get in a hurry. And if God doesn't instantly meet that need, you make up your own plan. And you try to meet your own needs yourself. And we do this all the time. We short circuit God's will in our life, God's blessings in our lives by going for the quick fix, the cheap thrill, the, the instant hit, the quick relief that's just temporary. A little temporary fix. And we do it all the time. We don't wait for God's will in our lives. I know I've done it. I haven't. There's times that I have not waited for God. I've gotten ahead of God. Has anybody here this morning gotten ahead of God? Okay, I see those hands. We do it all the time. But we've got to learn from Abraham. We've got to learn from Sarah. They were promised a baby, a son who would be the father of a great nation. Remember the story? You remember it. As Abraham got older, older and Sarah got older, nothing happened. They just kept getting older and no older and didn't have any kids, didn't have a son. They were promised a baby. God had promised them a son. He promised Abraham he'd be the father of a great nation. And as Abraham got older, nothing happened. He had no kids. His wife Sarah was, seemed to be infertile. And, and so instead of what? Instead of waiting and instead of trusting God, what did they do? You know the story. Sarai says to Abram, well, I can't have any kids. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Genesis chapter 16. And of course, Abraham being a man, he thinks this is a great idea. And he agrees with Sarah. And he goes and he sleeps with Hagar. And she conceives. And the world has been suffering ever since. Because you know the story of Ishmael. He's kind of the father of the Arab nation and Islam. Hagar has a baby and he named, names him Ishmael. So Abram 
Abraham, he holds up this baby, Ishmael, and he says to God, God, here's the miracle boy. And what does God say? No, that ain't him. No, that's your plan, Abraham. That's your plan. I've got a baby over here named Isaac, and he's coming next year. He's the one that's going to be the father of the great nation. We've got to learn from Abraham and Sarai's mistake. How many times do we do this? We get in a hurry. We figure out our own plan to meet our own needs and ask God to bless that plan. And God isn't going to do it. God's not going to bless that relationship that you've tried to force on him. God's not going to bless all those other plans that you've tried to force on him, Christian. Some of you right now are struggling with financial pressure in your life, and the temptation is to cut corners, to be unscrupulous, to stop giving to church, to cheat on your taxes, to do an unethical business deal, anything to get out of debt, when in reality you wouldn't be in debt had you waited on God. Some of you right now have tremendous sexual tension and pressure in your life. And you think you're going to explode because you don't have someone to have sex with. Even though God has been very, very clear and he says sex is only for marriage. He's very clear in scripture about this. You come up with every kind of rationalization you can think of. And believe me, after being a pastor for 30 years, I've heard everything. I've heard every rationalization. We're both Christians. We love her. We love each other so much. Don't be such a prude, Pastor. God won't mind. God won't care. We love each other. But listen clearly. God is not mocked. God's not going to let you get away with it. And if you go ahead and do it against God's word, you're the one that's going to suffer. And don't blame God later when you have some kind of a situation that you can't seem to handle. That's out of control. Blame yourself. God is not mocked. He's not going to allow you to get away with things like that. Some of you are under enormous emotional pressure. And, and instead of turning to God, you reach for that bottle. My family's been reaching for the bottle for I don't know how many years. I come from an alcoholic family, a bunch of drunks. And it would have been for my mother and some old ladies from this church. <laughs> I'd ended up where my grandfather's ended up, drinking himself to death at 43, making a mockery of my family. God is not mocked. You don't reach for a bottle. You don't go to the medicine cabinet for those prescription medicines. It's a quick fix. It doesn't solve the problem. What's the antidote? If you're walking in darkness without a ray of light, trust in the Lord and re rely upon Him. Rely upon God. It's a test. Are you going to turn to Christ or are you going to turn to other things? It's a test. Will you trust God, Christian? Will you cry out to Him? He's there. He's waiting for you. Psalm 34, 17, the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them, and he delivers them from all their troubles. Amen? Delivers them from all their troubles. The righteous cry out. Cry out to God. If you're having an issue, a problem in any part of your life, cry out to God. Cry. second test is the people test. And God often uses people in your life to test, to stretch, and develop your faith. This test is, how will I handle disappointment? I don't know about you, but life is often disappointing. Things don't always turn out the way we plan them. Careers don't turn out the way you plan them. Marriages don't turn out the way you plan them. Plans don't turn out the way you plan them. The fact is, life is disappointing a lot of times. But the most disappointing thing in life, listen, the most disappointing thing in life are people. People. 
I've met some of the best people in church, the most godly people in church, and I've met, met some of the most vile people in church. And that's a sad testimony of people in church, of supposedly Christians. People let you down. They disappoint you. Why do we get disappointed by people in life? You get disappointed by people when you expect them to meet a need in your life that only God himself can meet. When you turn to a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a father or a mother or a husband or a wife, a pastor, a friend, and you expect them to meet all your needs, listen, you're setting yourself up for the massive, massive disappointment. God never intended that for anybody. Nobody could possibly meet all your needs. No human. And when they let you down, you think, well, what's wrong with them? What's wrong with them? The problem isn't them. The problem is you. You put an expectation on them that they couldn't possibly fulfill. You put an expectation on them. This is a test. So many of you have thought in the past, if only I could get married, then I would be fulfilled and satisfied and all my problems would go away. <laughs> Boy, that's not true. <laughs> That's what people think, though. If only my children were different, like the children next door, then I would be so much more satisfied and contented. If I had just had different parents, Lord, life would be so much better. Life would have been so much better if I had different parents. Listen, your problem is not the people in your life. Your problem is your response to the people in your life. Let me say that one more time because that needs to be said again. Your problem is not the people in your life. The problem, your problem, is your response to the people in your life. Get it right. People are not the problem and they're not the answer to the problem either. The answer to your insecurity is not another person. The answer to your inferiority is not another person. The answer to your worries and your fears is not another person. The answer to your depression, your despair, your discouragement is not another person. The answer to your sense of failure is not another person. And the answer to your meaninglessness in life, your lack of purpose and boredom with life, your deep dissatisfaction is not another person. The answer to all of these things is God. you got to turn to Him. When you expect other people to be your Savior... When you expect other people to be your savior, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. You really are. The Bible says this in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 22. Stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? That sounds great. Don't expect a person to be the answer to all your problems. It's not going to happen. Listen, there is only one Savior, one Redeemer, and His name is Jesus Christ. Trust Him. Amen? Stop it. Jeremiah 17, 7 says, Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made Him, not other people, their hope and confidence. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord. The next time you have some issue, some problem arises. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to turn to the Lord. You're not going to turn to your bank book. You're not going to pull out your credit card. You're going to turn to the Lord. My car broke down. I don't know how to fix it. I don't have any money. No, so let's put it on the credit card. Let's go further in debt than we already in. Does that make sense? Turn to the Lord. Ask people in church to pray for you. You'll be surprised how God delivers. You really will. If you trust Him. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made Him their hope and confidence. Is God your hope and confidence? Is He? What happens if you do this? Look at God's promise in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 23. Anyone, it says, who trusts in me will not be disappointed. Anyone who trusts in me 
will not be disappointed. Because you're trusting in other people and other things besides God. I mean, that's what happens when you don't trust in Him. So are you going to handle disappointment by complaining and griping and crying and grieving and worrying? Or are you going to accept that God knows what's best? That God has a loving plan for your life. That God loves you and knows what you need. He knows what you need more than you do. That he's in control. And that even the disappointments in your life have a positive purpose, whether you understand it or not. It's a test. Are you going to trust God with the things that disappoint your life? The Bible says, anyone who trusts in me will not be disappointed. Isn't that great? That's good to know. All right, we got two more tests. Let's, let's get going. We don't have much time, right? Anyone who trusts in me will not be disappointed. I love that verse. The Bible says we must trust God. And this next test is the persistence test. Will I keep my commitments? The persistence test. Will I keep my commitments? Life is about making commitments. Your life is shaped by your commitments. Your character is developed by your commitments. Your success is influenced by your commitments. And listen, your eternal destiny, your eternal destiny is determined by your commitments. So you would better choose what you're committed to very carefully. I mean, heaven and hell are in the balance. You become whatever you're committed to. The problem we have today in our culture is that most people are half committed to two dozen things instead of being totally committed to one or two things in life that really matter for now and eternity. We're so sporadic. We're not committed to any, any specific thing. We have a thousand of different things that we're trying to do. And we're really not committed to one or two things that really matter. It's, it's really sad. If you're going to develop any skill or any maturity, for that matter, you've got to learn to make and keep commitments. Let's say you want to learn a musical instrument. Let's say you want to learn to play the piano. My wife's been teaching piano for almost 30 years, at least 30 years. And she's had a lot of great students, but she's had a lot of students that just were not committed. It's not automatic. You just don't sit down and it's instantaneous. You just say, I'm taking piano lessons, and all of a sudden, you know, you're a Liberace or one of those pianists. Right? To play and learn an instrument, you, you know, you have to develop your skill, and it takes practice and more practice and more practice, which takes persistence, which takes discipline, which requires commitment. And the hallmark of emotional and spiritual maturity is you make and you keep wise commitments. The uncommitted person, there's a word for them, selfish, immature. Immaturity shows itself in the inability to keep commitments. Some of you need to understand that no commitment that really matters is easy. They're all hard if they're important. So you can expect your commitment will be tested by God. Some of you are in the commitment test right now. Your marriage vows are being tested. Is it really going to be till death do us part? I made a vow in front of people and before God. Till death do us part. Am I going to keep that or am I going to walk out? And what a lot of people are choosing to do today is just walk out. Well, the grass must be greener on the other side of the fence. She can't cook, so I'll just go find somebody who can. I tell you, for little things, people are walking out of their marriage relationships. Why even get married if you can't keep your commitment? Marriage isn't easy. I was telling people yesterday, if it was easy, people would be staying married. It's not. It's a lot of work to stay married. It's a commitment. Some of you are having personal integrity problems, and your personal integrity is being tested right now. I know the thing to do, but am I going to do the easy thing and the convenient thing or the popular thing, the thing that everybody else wants to do? That's the, those are the questions. It's, it's a test. It's a test of your character. Ecclesiastes 5, 4 says, if you make a promise to God, listen to this carefully, if you make a promise to God, don't be slow to keep it. God is not happy with fools. So give God what you promised. Amen? What commitments have you made to God that you failed to follow through, through with? What commitments? 
You're giving. You're reading the Bible every day. Joining a church. Helping out in church. Sharing with your neighbors about Christ. What commitments have you made to Christ? Have you made to God that you've let slack off? This is a test of your character and your faith. Ecclesiastes 8.5, the wise man will find a time and a way to do what he says. A wise man will find a way to do what he says. The wise person figures out a way to keep his or her commitments. The weak person cops out. The weak person says, I made that commitment, but I'm, going to blow it. I'm just going to blow it off. I made that commitment you know, back then, but I'm not going to follow through with, through with it now. I didn't really mean it, people will say. Circumstances have changed. I don't need to keep that commitment anymore. Listen, weak people give excuses. Wise people find the time and the way to do what they say. And they'll do it. Do you want to be a weak person or do you want to be a wise person? It's a test of your character, of your faith. It's a test of the kind of character you're going to, going to develop. This is one of the major faults in our society today. People give up too easy. They give up in the test before hanging in there to make it through. They give up too soon. People have one little marriage problem. I can't handle this. I don't deserve this. i got to get out of this relationship. And they just walk. By the way, I've been spending a lot of time with marriage. If you can't see that. I can't handle this. i just got to get out of this relationship. I can't afford to do the right thing in this business deal because if I do the right thing, I'm going to lose my job. It's a test. It's a test. It's a test of your character and a test of your faith. The Bible says in Psalm 15 that God blesses the person who keeps his vows even when it hurts. That's the kind of person God blesses. And it's a test. It's a test. Let's look at number four, the priorities test. And they all said... Ooh, finally got to point number four. <laughs> the priorities test. I, I don't know about you, but I, this is the most important test of all. I say the most important test for the last. The priorities test. This is the most important test. The priorities test is in life is this. Who will be first? Who will be first in my life? Or you could say, what will be first? in my life. Who will be first in my life? What will be first in my life? One of the great promises of the Bible deals with this test. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And you all know this because you probably sang the song for years. But seek first his kingdom. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. All these things. Seek first his kingdom. What's his kingdom? It's God's kingdom. It's the things that deal with God. It's all about God. What does God want? What is God teaching? What does God say? It's his kingdom. Everything about God. That's the kingdom of God. We think it's a building of some kind or some, you know, we're talking about heaven. No, we're talking about the kingdom of God here on earth. The kingdom. God's will, God's work here on earth. Seek first his kingdom. Do the things that God wants you to do here. And his righteousness. Seek first his righteousness. What's righteousness? It's the things that are right according to God. The things that are right according to God's word. The things that Jesus taught. Those are the things that are right. You seek those things first. Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his righteousness. The things that are just. Things that are right according to God's word. You seek those things first. And all these other things will be given done to you as well. I don't know about you, but that really speaks to me. You want these other things in your life? You've got to put God first. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. You have legitimate needs in your life. You have some financial needs. You have some emotional needs. You have some relational needs. You have some physical needs. You have some spiritual needs. These are legitimate and they are real. But God has promised to meet every one of those needs if you put him first. And we're not doing that, Christians. 
You put him first in every area of your life. Come what may. How do you know if God is really the first, first priority in your life? How do you know that? I'm going to give you three questions. Let me ask you these three questions. What do I do or what do I think about the most? When I have free time, what does my mind naturally wander towards? Whatever, whatever you think about the most, Christian, is what's the most important thing in your life. What do I think about the most? Number two, where does my money go first? That's a great one. Where does my, the Bible says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And it says, even further, lay up treasure in heaven, where moth and rust does not destroy. Lay up your treasure in heaven. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It determines your priorities. It reveals them. And number three, how do I spend my time? How do I spend my time? That reveals the priorities in my life. It, show me your checkbook stubs and your calendar, and I'll tell you what's really first in your life. Show it to me. I don't care what you say is number one, what you say you value, what you think is most important. The way you spend your time and the way you spend your money and what you think about most often is what's really first in your life. And if, it, if Christ and the kingdom of God and his righteousness is not first in your life, you took these tests, you, you're going down the list with me, and you've, signed, you, you've said to yourself, you know what, I haven't really put God first. It's time to make some changes. It's time to make some changes. Amen? Listen, I, I haven't always been the kind of Christian that I needed to be. I haven't always been the kind of pastor that I've needed to be, that God wants me to be. I've had to learn to change. I've had to let God, you know, put me down and, and push me around and show me where I needed to be in my relationship with Him. It's not easy. But it's something that God wants us to do. We need to put him first. All right. You say, Pastor, I've had enough for today. <laughs> Remember King Solomon? Man, if anybody had anything more than the rest of us, it was Solomon. God gave him so much wisdom. And yet the smartest man in the world succumbed to, to the will of his wives. Of course, he had a couple thousand, it seemed. Which was another crazy thing, right? When you read the Bible. Concubines. What? And he succumbed to them and he started worshiping false gods. Solomon had everything. Don't be like him. Learn from Jesus. Learn from the scriptures. All right, we looked at four points, four tests. Which of these four tests are you going through right now where God's testing your faith in how much you're going to trust him? Are you going through the pressure test? Is he seeing how I can go? How am I going through stress? How am I going to handle stress? Turn to him or turn to other things to relieve my stress? How about the people test? Are you going, are you, how are you handling disappointment, Christian? Are you complaining about it? Are you griping about it? Or are you realizing that God is a loving God and that he knows what's best for you? Or, you know... Maybe you're, you're trusting in the wrong thing because anyone who trusts in God, it says, will not be disappointed. You've got to turn and trust in Him. How about the persistence test? Are you keeping your commitments? Everybody seems to start off great at the beginning of the marathon, but they start getting out halfway through. You've got to pick up the pace. You've got to get back in the race. Are you keeping your commitments to other people and even to God? It's a test. And the priorities test. Lastly, what is first in my life? Who is first in my life? Some of you are saying, I don't think I'm going to pass this test, Pastor. Because I'm worn out, weak, and fatigued. Listen, if your delight is in the Lord, if your delight is in His Word, you're going to be like a tree that's planted along the riverbank and bearing much fruit each season. Amen. So put God first. Your leaves will never wither and you'll prosper in all you do. 
But you've got to trust God. You've got to keep on trusting Him throughout your life. And then you, as a Christian, will thrive. And they all say. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning for the good things that you have taught us. We praise you for all that you've helped us to understand. And I pray, Lord, if there's some that haven't truly understood what was presented, what was said, I pray that you would help, help them to understand it. Help them, Holy Spirit, to realize what they need to do and the changes they need to make. Father, I pray that you would help each Christian here this morning. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help them grow in their walk with you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would remind them that they need to put Christ first in their lives. Always. 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 Lord Jesus, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. And we thank you for this day. It's in your name that we pray. Hallelujah. And amen.